Hi, you guys. This is Erin. Welcome to the second episode of the If You Could See Me podcast. On this episode, I got the opportunity to sit down with my dear friend, Slash Coleman. Slash is an artist and a musician, a storyteller, and an author. He wrote the foreword to my book, which meant an enormous amount to me. Um, I followed Slash for a really long time and uh, was first a fan and then became a friend. And uh, he has a lot of really interesting experiences, lots of wonderful wisdom to share with the world, and uh, is generally someone who helps me you know, keep my head on and find my, find my Zen when I'm getting a little bit uh, overwhelmed with all of the demands of being a creative person in the world. So uh, I'm immensely grateful to uh, have his friendship and to have had the opportunity to talk to him on this day. And I hope you enjoy. Thanks so much. Hello to my friend Slash hmm. Coleman. Hello. I'm so happy you're here with me today. Oh, good. Um, okay, so I'm really interested to know you are all of these things. You're a musician and an artist and an author and a, and a storyteller. And when did you know you were an artist? You write a lot about yourself as a creative child. And like, when did you say, this is what I am? Or did you ever, or have you ever, or have you yet? Well, I think on, on like, like a lot of kids, I guess. I mean, because I have eight artists in my family. And so you grow up like, you know, I grow up and my dad's a sculptor. My grandma's like a prolific painter. My, you know, my grandfather's like a former dancer at the Moulin Rouge. And so it just goes, the list goes on and on. So I knew I wanted to be an artist. But like, how do you especially go into your teen years and rebel against what you hate? But then that's the thing that like where I found my solace was like alone, either with my notebook drawing um, or writing. Um, and I found music like early on, you know, I was like, I took lessons, you know, cause I have synesthesia. So like, um, I learned art and, um, music and, and any kind of genre in a very different way than most people. Can um, you talk about what synesthesia is for people who don't know? Yeah. And so like, um, uh, like I, I can taste sounds and I, um, hear shapes and, uh, so when I learned piano, it was a very different way. I would see words form over the keys. And um, I was in fifth grade at the time, and uh, I kept a whole notebook. My, cause my fa I grew up in my father's art studio, so he kept me stocked with, with um, Moleskine and sketchbooks forever. Um, and so I, kept, I documented all these like kind of emotion note combinations in my, in my notebooks. Um, and I wanted to find a teacher to teach me those things. I, I could never find a teacher. They wanted me to learn scales and, and uh, uh, whatever they teach kids to, to learn. And, and so I wasn't, I've never been a very good student, even today, because I learned so differently. I, I just came off of a, um, like four months of uh, learning Italian with an Italian teacher. And finally, she fired me and I fired her because I don't <laughs> learn in a, any traditional way. I'm like off the maps in terms of like how I pick things up. And like most people just don't get it. So how do you think that, that that your unique perspective makes you uh makes you different as an as as an artist or as a as an expressive person? I mean, so I'm an artist, I'm a creative person, but I'm, you know, I learn in a much more sort of traditional way. So I mean, you you're just your brain is just so vastly vastly different. How how does yeah, that wired change your experience? Yeah, well, I remember in my um 20s when I like was like uh, really into learning uh, jazz mm -hmm. um, and I just sank myself into it um, because there's this idea of um, they say when you really get into jazz there's it becomes a difference between playing horizontal and playing vertical and I was like beginning to go and sh make that shift for advanced jazz people like begin to play vertical um, and I was living up in Maine and I had hooked up with these all uh, former jazz professors. They were all like 20 or 30 years older than me. But still, even though I began to keep up with them um, in the jazz, it, when, we, when we would play, um, I'm completely unable to solo. And so in jazz, you take fours. And so everyone will take you know four measures of like soloing. And um, it's impossible for me because as I begin to solo like the first measure into like probably the, the second measure, um, 
things begin to happen like that don't happen with other musicians. And so I got, I, I can solo for about a measure and a half and then I would have to get out. And no one could un understand that. I couldn't really even understand it at the time because I didn't know that that's like what, what my diagnosis was. That's really interesting. Um, and so like I could, I could comp with the best of them. I can keep up with any musician, but if you put, put me in solo mode, like forget about it. Cause like something starts to happen and some kind of misfire and then I begin to see things and like I begin to hear different things and I begin to, s the, I begin to smell things and, and you go like off into some yeah sort of I can't keep up I get completely lost and it doesn't matter even the, even the, the simpler songs um, like when jazz went modal where like a whole song would just be on like one chord that was your song right. I couldn't even solo on like one chord so these aren't even complicated things very simple things um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm interested in that because I have, I mean, and this is something completely different, but as a singer, I can relate to this to a degree um, because of the fact that I'm, I have a really hard time counting. Mm -hmm. I have a really hard time, like I, I don't know if it's an ADD thing or what it is, but I just sort of like, if I'm in the midst of a song or I'm scatting or I'm trying to, it, I have a really hard time following what everybody else is doing and also because I want to go off, you know, in my own realm. Yeah. And it's an enormous challenge for me as a musician to the to the point where I feel like it just sort of got in my way. And so, I mean, I, it, it, it makes me sad that I, I really feel inept, like I can't continue to, I can't grow to the point where I would like to grow as a jazz vocalist. Um, because I, I, I have not been able to break through whatever that, that wall is. Um, and so I'm just curious to know, because your brain works differently, but in a similar way that it sort of limited you, how did, how did you, I mean, was that disappointing for you? Well, I got, I got f f through the years, I got fired from a lot of jazz groups. Yeah. Because um, that was that one area where I, I couldn't do that. But, but yet they would bring in other musicians to replace me, and then they would always come back to me, maybe like a year or two later. Oh, really? And it ha started to happen early on, because I got into jazz when I was like 16, and I got a job here in Richmond on the Annabelle Lee, which was like this uh, cruise ship where you would get on board, and like people would eat dinner, and then um, I was, I was, I had to sight read a bunch of stuff and the waiters would like sing songs and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I worked there too. Oh, okay. okay cool. so you <laughs> My know husband about it. <laughs> and I met there actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, it's really I crazy. got fired early on from that gig because of like the solo problem and like the synesthesia. But, um, a year later they called me back and they're like, well, you know, everyone we hired just wasn't as nice as you. And we love like your attitude and your vibe awesome. and all that. And like, we'll try to overlook this one piece. But what it comes down to is like, cause uh, um, in a sense, you know, with other instruments that I play with guitar and stuff, like um, I'm, I'm kind of a one trick pony with that thing. Like, so see, someone will see me doing my own stuff, singer songwriter stuff. And they're like, wow, the person's like a really prolific musician. Mm -hmm. um, let's jam a little bit and, and I'm not able to do that. And so like, I'm not able to do certain things right. that, that people, the, the illusion is I, I, I am able to. So it's almost like, um, I learned to like walk with this limp and then no one sees the limp anymore. Wow. Um, with, with kind of like all my art in a way. That's so, really and, and so that's why like, I've never really, people will ask me, um, as a performer to perform in their, their, uh, stuff. And like, they're just, hugely disappointed like I, I've gotten fired a lot for that reason because I through the years I've written my own stuff mm -hmm. I can and it's never done the same way you know and that's the basis of like you know professional storytelling so I'm never telling the same story twice but if I have to memorize a script that belongs to someone else and there's a director there and they're like it needs to be this way um, it just doesn't work with me and so I've kind of navigated my way to like up in the like career food chain as an artist by kind of doing the things I'm really good at and like staying away from the things that like are going to upset other people and where I'm not going to fit in at all. Cause you know, I, I ended up going to grad school at Columbia college where that's where all the like square pegs that fit in round holes, like go. And like, I was like a triangle peg there. I didn't even fit in there. I got kicked out of like the MFA program in writing. Cause like I was just off the charts there too. Um, so, I mean, how, what is it? As artists, people, you know, we deal with rejection in a lot of different ways, and we certainly know how to feel um, like like a square peg in a round hole in the world. Yeah. Um, how did you deal with that? I mean, was that disappointing? Was it upsetting? Did you feel bad? I mean, I just like that would be that would feel so awful to me. But it just seems like you it just rolls off your back, and you just kind of shift gears, and you're like, all right, well, if that's not going to work, then I'm going to go over here. So. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, that seems I, like an amazing coping mechanism. <laughs> I guess so. And, you know, I, yeah, I don't know where that coping as you know, that coping mechanism probably comes from, like 
the um, kind of the, the tragedy I've dealt with in my family in right. terms of like our background and what I've had to deal with and dealing with them. And then you either just become, uh, you know, I guess that's where my rebellion came. I'm either going to become just like them um, or I'm going to rebel from that and become the opposite of that. And right. so like I've always had like a really positive attitude about things. And so I'm very sensitive like most artists, but like I haven't let that really affect me. It's amazing. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I like <clears throat> wasn't a little probably depressed when I got kicked out of grad school, but, um, uh, part of the excitement and my passion as an artist was like getting kicked out, you know? So it's right. like, you fed off of that and it turned it into another adventure for you to sort of go in a different direction. Yeah. So I guess that's a good, that's a kind of a good place for us to segue because, you know, you started out as a musician and you were a visual artist and still are, uh, you know, to some degree, but at some point you decided that writing and then, you know, professional storytelling was really going to be the thing that you, that you focused on. Um, what was that, you know, uh, moment for you that, that changed or was it a moment? Um, what I think it was because I had exhausted most of the other mediums that I had gone through. Like, so starting as a musician, um, and going down that road, I found that, you know, it, when I play music, the, what the sound waves, by the time they leave me and the emotion that I put into them and enter someone's like being, they can be interpreted in a million different ways. So I might be sad, but I might be playing something that's sad and someone else can interpret it as like, you know, uh, you know, joyful, right. depending on what their mood is. And then when, you know, I made my living doing, doing jazz for about like five years and then went in, right into visual art where I was making my living, a very good living for about five years. And um, again, like when someone takes a painting home, um, I did this cool thing where I traded my student loan payment book to anyone that bought a painting. And so like, they would be like, I want this painting. It's like 5,000 bucks. So I'd give them my student loan book and be like, um, pay, you know, the, the $200 a month. And when it's paid off, give me the book back. And I did that for like about five years and almost all my student loans were paid <laughs> That's off. That's unbelievable. Way. Yeah. Um, but, but, but again, like they take a painting home, put it on the wall. They, you can interpret it in a million different ways. Even a, a viewer can. So and I found when. I hit upon like storytelling because writing had always been my preferred medium. Um, and that was the thing I always did like alone in a room. Um, uh, writing again is the same way, but storytelling when I'm in front of someone telling a story, there, there is no brush that separates me from like 12 inches from me and the canvas. There's no sound wave that can be interpreted really differently. I'm right in front of people. The lights are on and I can see the motion. I can see how I'm affecting them. But then in return, I get a story. And so like it, it becomes this, um, process that I always like yearn for and maybe what kind of like hurt my my family of artists the most which was um you know wanting connection and community and doing my art for that reason but doing it in isolation which is the anti part of that but storytelling gave me that finally that connection yeah that yeah. I like yearn for that's I it's the thing that I you know I mean I did theater for years and I you know have sung for years and um, but when I started, uh, you know, writing shows and, and talking about my own life and doing those shows and really, you know, boiling down those things to things that were really personal to me and then performing them, it was like, oh, mm. this is what I wanted it to be. This is the kind of connection that I have really longed for. And I, I totally understand that. But it's I, I mean, it's like you have to go there you have to do yeah, that yeah right right so so you know you write about yourself and you write about your life and you started doing that i mean i guess you've you've done that for years but the thing that really kind of put you on the map was your show the neon man and me right right yeah and yeah. so can you talk a little bit about that trajectory and about what compelled you to to tell that story and and keep telling it and you know and and where it took you what it taught you yeah i don't i i think with a lot of my art I, it doesn't feel like as much as a choice as a calling and all even from the beginning like the, i feel like a medium or a story or the content will choose me and i think um elizabeth gilbert who wrote eat pray love talks yeah. about it and i think her book was big magic about how the the idea will fly into the world and fly around a bunch of different artists and some of them say yes and some of them say no and some of them say not right now and I know that all of us as artists can like be haunted by that idea if we don't choose to to uh, have it come and join us and and go for it. And so, um, I you know, 
I had forced an idea before them. My first one man show was called Love in Boxes. Um, and I set up a, a national tour and I had like a, a, um, uh, a, a sponsor for that, that sponsored the whole tour. And, um, six months into it, I didn't want to tell that story anymore. It was about being like, you know, a love failure and about my divorce and things like that. And so I took it off tour and, you know, so, um, when my best friend had died and I found, you know, I, I began to feel this calling of like creating something to kind of honor our friendship. Um, I was a little wary, you know, cause I didn't know if I'd like write it and bring in a director and rehearse it and then put it on tour and like be kind of sick of it after six months. And, and since then it's been like a learning process because since then I've done that, I've like felt that calling and, and welcomed it in to collaborate and, um, six months in again it just is time to shelve it and so that particular one though I was I was really blessed because you know um after he died I it, uh about a, he he was um a neon uh, artist from Roanoke Virginia and he was blown into a power line after um hanging a neon sign and then a month after he died his girlfriend found out she was pregnant and so I just oh. began to write down my memories of him in my atlas when I would drive around uh Richmond and um anything that I remembered about our friendship, I'd write into my Atlas. And then my plan was just to put all those memories into a box and ship it off to his son when and he was old enough, maybe he would read it and, um, uh, come and ask me questions. And, uh, it was probably about when I, I, I remember I took the box to the post office in Carytown and I, I put a bunch of his old letters to me and a bunch of mementos and some photos and, um, recordings of our jazz, jazz ensemble. And it just didn't seem right. It just seemed like a really disconnected way to like just send this box to his son who would open at a future date. Um, I had already had the history with the other one man show, Love and Boxes. And so I remember feeling like, oh, this feels right. Um, and I called his parents and I was like, I would like to like make this, um, these notes that I have in my atlas, a story about your son. Can I have your blessing? I, I didn't know what they were doing. They didn't get my, my, give me the blessing. And they gave me the blessing and, um, for the next year, I, I fleshed it out into that, that piece, um, brought in a director and had another um, patron sponsor the first show out in Roanoke. And I really just expected it to be for his, um, it ran for two weeks there at um, Mill Mountain Theater. I really expected it just to be his family and members of uh, his church. And I felt like God picked me up on a car on that first night and I got in the passenger seat and I took off, and so it became my full-time job for almost nine years. Um, you know, it became a PBS special that aired nationally, like, in front of 77 million people. Like, every two months it was airing in front of that many people. Um, it became a, um, a school curriculum for kids that I, that I um, taught to um, uh, kids and adults all across the nation. It was sponsored by the, the National Endowment for the Arts, where I would uh, go in and help kids who had suffered tragedy in the inner city and like tell their own story and perform it on stage and, and actually do, um, big shows where they would get to keep the money and use it for the school. Um, and then it became a fundraiser where instead of selling tickets to the show, um, people, or I mean, instead of selling like candy bars for school events, they would sell tickets to the show and they would get to keep all the money. And I helped raise like over, um, like a million and a half dollars for nonprofits anywhere for that, that wanted to sponsor the show. And, you know, eventually it, it, it to me, it, it ran off Broadway for a short time and it ended when, um, uh, I remember I had set up some <coughs> meetings about nine years later after the first run where, um, I was meeting with Broadway producers mm -hmm. and that had been my dream all along was to take it on Broadway. And, uh, by then, you know, I had performed the show about 1500 times pretty much every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for like almost like eight, eight years. Um, but it felt done at that right. point. Like the idea was like, um, I had, it had run its course. But how did you let it go right before you got to where the original, you know, the original goal was to, to go to Broadway? Yeah. And how did you let it go? Well, I think it's hard as an artist to, in this world where everything's quantified and qualified and it, from what I know in all my projects, I've got like that business side. So I create a business plan for each of my projects and like, know that like, you know, a business takes about five years to, right. to really succeed. And from what I know from one man shows and some of the, the people I've emulated, which are Tyler Perry and like Neo Vardarlos of my big fat Greek wedding, right. 
you have to perform a story at you know four to five thousand times before it hits the mainstream and you know i i told that story of the neon man and me like 1500 times and that brings me to a point where i'm talking with broadway producers and it airs on pbs and so that's only a quarter of what i needed to do before it becomes really well known in the mainstream right um and so since then i've like prayed about projects where i'm like okay i i have to become this thing for like this one project where you're it's kind of like being known as for a cover song for like at least like five or six (laughs) years and so how do how do we for me it it doesn't become necessarily like how do I like maintain my passion and excitement for a project after all that time it's like um I think it's really up to the project I don't really have a choice in it it's like if I'm listening to like the the art piece itself Mm -hmm. it's almost like this zeitgeist thing the world's kind of telling dictating the whole thing and I'm just kind of a vehicle in it so in terms of letting it go I I don't think I I really had a choice in it it like it just begins it like yeah it, it, it leaves it's like yeah. it's say goodbye now and I'm done with you, you. you know <laughs> yeah exactly wow so i just uh, your um your practice of unattachment is admirable hmm. i mean it is that that is you know that is something that i as an individual person really struggle with that um sort of control freakness of the world and, you know, Mm. holding on to everything very tightly and, and trying to, you know, make it go in the direction that I want it to go. And I, you know, just on a personal level, I find it incredibly admirable to, you know, to be able to get to that point and just say, okay, well, you know, I, and to, it seems like you have a lot of faith that there will Mm. be another project, that there will be another, that you will be chosen once again as a vehicle for another thing. And, um, that's, that's really, it's exciting. It's, it's, it's hopeful. It gives me hope. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how did the neon man in me lead to your book, the Bohemian love diaries? Cause it sounds like you had a rid, you had started telling that story with the first one man show a little bit, and then you kind of put it down and then you came back to it, which is a story about your life and your, your you know, challenges with love, but also mm-hmm. your family and your relationships with your parents and, you know, how that all kind of worked together. Was it important for you to tell your story of your family? Did you think about it or was it another thing that just sort of, this is what I'm going to do now? This is what's going to happen. Yeah, well, um, I, with the... With the Neon Man, so I, I've never taken a theater class or been in a, like a show or anything like that, and so it was very much like a organic process of mm-hmm. like finding the stage. And um, but you know, I, I had spent years on the stage as a musician, right. so it wasn't like the stage was new to me. It wasn't like writing was new to me. Like when he died, like my chops were polished in terms of like stage time and like mm-hmm. uh, my my work. But um, uh, in terms of like getting on stage and telling that story, I didn't even consider myself a, a storyteller at that point. All I knew was like, okay, this is how you do things in the theater. I guess you write a script and then you memorize it and you try to pretend like it's not memorized and you bring in a director to kind of help you do that. And then you bring in like a tech crew to like do the lighting. And I guess that, you know, if it's kind of like I Googled like how you do this. Um, right. There weren't any real books to read. And at the time, like, um, I had only seen one person do a one person show. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have a, like a lot of now, now I think the, um, the world is full of one person shows, but mm-hmm. then there, there weren't a lot. I know like that, um, uh, Spalding Gray had done some stuff that kind of bored me cause he sat at a desk and, but people love that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but that wasn't someone like I, I emulated. Um, and so, uh, in terms of like, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> I went on a tangent. That's okay. I was just what curious was how you went from, you know, telling that story to, you know, writing the oh, book yeah. and talking about your family and your own personal experiences. Because, I mean, it's different to tell someone else's story than it is. And, of course, this yeah. was your friend and this is a personal relationship to you. But, you know, to then completely start talking about yourself. Yeah. I, I didn't know a lot when I, um, I've been writing for a long time, but I didn't know a lot about how you're supposed to go about doing things on stage. It was eight stories about friendship and then four songs I played on my guitar. Um, the songs I was inspired to create and they're real non-traditional in terms of, in terms of songwriting. There's not traditional courses in there mm-hmm. um, where you can like sing along even though they're kind of poppy. And the stories had a beginning and middle and end and like a plot curve. But in terms of theater, it traditionally, like if you look at what 
works on stage, it, it's not stuff that should work. Right. But people were drawn to it in theaters everywhere. Um, and most people um, that never had gone in a theater was pulling in people that, that um, were intimidated by theater. And I guess right. because like I didn't have a theater background and so that, that they were connected uh, to the, the piece in that way, which speaks to the content more than like how it was. And most of the people around me couldn't understand it. People had gone to um, school to study theater and, and um, art. And here I was, didn't do any of that. And yet I was making my living in a the theater for right. like, you know, six or seven years. And so um, in that real non-traditional way, what I had created eight stories um, that were experiences. And so I wanted to, people in the audience to ex- have an emotional experience while I was experiencing it on stage, mm-hmm. not so much as a voyeur, but to create this emotion in them. And so it was a really non-traditional approach to what I was doing. It was an experiment on, um, it, it was kind of like the, the, it, I, the theater was a laboratory for me. Right. And so, um, and I wanted to do the same thing when I wrote the first draft of, of my book, um, the Bohemian love diaries, which was, when I took it to my literary agent, I literally only had maybe five short stories. I had always been in love with the short story form because it was a it, w- it was something I could wrap my head around, kind of like in the way that um, I wasn't able to solo as a jazz musician. It was just too much in there. And so I had, I had written a couple novel, novels before, but there was too much in there for me to begin to get lost and the synesthesia to kick in. But the short story was like, okay, it's short. It's not as short as flash fiction. It's not as long as a novel, but it was something I could wrap my head around without getting lost in it. Right. I'd always been in love with the short story form, which is basically what I did with the Neon Man, which taking the short story form on stage. And so when I approached my literary agent, I had like maybe five semi-completed short stories. And what I wanted to do with the book was the same exact thing I wanted to do on the stage with the Neon Man, which was like, I wanted the reader to have an emotional response to experience I was putting in each chapter. Mm -hmm. And she was the one that really kind of shaped it into this thing of like, there's no genre for this. I can't sell this. You're going to have a book of not even short stories, but an uh, an experience where a reader is going to have like an emotional response. I just don't get it. And so she was like, to make it marketable, we're going to have to like create this longer plot curve and you, it, the best way to do it is like to do it chronologically from like your birth into like however oh. you want to go and that that wasn't my idea at all and being really green to like the um the the literary publication process and um and kind of defaulting and being really easily influenced i was like hey, you know what you're doing i'd like to get these stories out there on a uh the widest level possible to the biggest audience possible um so you let's go with your your idea i'm not so um in some ways it would have been a very different project if i would have stuck to my guns in some ways i wish i would have stuck to my guns it may have never become a published book um in the way that it was and i may have never explored the things that i did about my family but in, in the beautiful sense if if i in a sense i was being led to to create something i wouldn't normally create this the idea was calling to me like elizabeth gilbert says and then my liter- b- 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 people begin to come into my life to kind of shape it into this bigger thing to you know to to reach a wi- the widest audience as possible which i think as artists and our egos like that a lot of us that's what we really want and now that i've had that where i've like performed that story some nights in front of like 5000 people at a time um it's just the opposite now i don't I don't see like um, accomplishment um, with really huge venues and theaters. I really see it about connection with like maybe like 12 people in the audience, right. which makes it a very different process for me now in terms of like my art. So um, how did you approach the process of talking about your family? Because, you know, you have a family that's kind of fraught with, you know, challenges and, and drama and, you know, all the things that that most of us try to hide about our families, right? And yeah. so a lot of what, um, you know, if you could see me, this podcast and, and you know, the work that, that I do in the world is about not hiding those things and not keeping those secrets and, and you know, saying out loud to the world that, you know, we deal with a bunch of shit as humans and it's okay to talk about it, but yeah. not everybody's family is okay being the guinea pig. So how did you approach that with your, with your people? And, you know, what did you think about when you started to tell those stories? Hmm. Well, you know, 
coming from a family on my mom's side of Holocaust survivors and my mom, you know, being raised uh, during the war too and, um, you know, getting sick to a Catholic mission while her parents, like, escaped the camps and were in and out of camps and worked for the French resistance. Um, you know, there was all this silence on her side. And, you know, my being a second-generation Holocaust survivor and my cousins as well, um, we wanted to find out information. My mom to this day is still silent on it. And the the second generation, we cousins would get together as we got older and we would be like, did you find anything out? And like, we would share this information that we would like, it was kind of like just trying to get like water from a rock. It was very hard to get any of the information, but we would, we cherished it and we'd be like, yeah, I found this out. This is what happened. So having all that silence on that side. And then um, on the other side, uh, my dad's family from Sicily, um, where it's like you sit around the table and you share stories around big Mediterranean meals on a regular basis. And it's all like just about community and like, sh uh, sharing and, and, and all that. Um, I kind of looked, uh, to, to my father's side to see how I could to find connection on my mother's side. Cause still to this day, there's all the silence, but the, the, I guess the key in it, um, was that you know on my father's side there's um they've always suffered from addiction and alcoholism and mm -hmm. so growing up in that there's like a double whammy of silence where my mom was like don't tell anyone you're jewish you'll get killed you'll die and like seeing that play out in you know elementary school middle school where i got beat up for being jewish um and uh then the alcoholism which is like don't tell anyone like your father like uh, you know, sleeping in the backyard, passed out, or like he wrecked the car, or or right. whatever it is. There was all the silence there, and so for me, it, it's not the same for my sisters, but because um, it, it's just us five in the family. Even though we come from a huge extended family, I think in the alcoholic family, um, from what we know of the disease, you you take on certain roles. There's a peacekeeper, right. there's a secret keeper, there's there's the one that wants to make everything better. And for me, there became a point where I had to keep so many secrets, like from my mom's side, my dad's side, and like um, even my grandmother, who who eventually like um, you know uh, get, you know suck them to the like the fates of like mental illness, mm -hmm. um, and was in and out of um, institutions and stuff. Um, it there were just too many secrets to keep. And it, it, if I had attempted to tell these stories in my 20s, it would have been a very different um, story to tell. I think it would have been filled with anger and it wouldn't have been cohesive. And um, it would have been, I, I, I don't know, like probably like a really angry response to those secrets. But by the time like my book was published and I went on tour with Neo Man, I was like nearing my 40s and I had let go a lot of that anger. And I become so uh, proficient at the, the the literary form that I saw that it was more important to tell a story with like the literary craft elements with like humor and like an intro and like it wasn't as raw at that point right. um, and so uh, part of it was like just letting go of like a lot of that my response to it and seeing it as someone else's story almost it was like a, a disconnect in a way um, it, there is a, a sense of um freedom that comes at least in my experience from being able to do that i'm really curious because i you know i teach workshops and i talk to people about how to tell their own story and i'm curious as to what you say to people when you have that you know you said you worked with kids and you know and groups uh, you, you know how do you talk to people about i mean for me it's part of it is letting people know that they have to come to that place on their own and there are certain things you're not going to be able to tell a story about at this point without it being angry and you know and you can't you but it's you've got to go through your life so i'm curious how you talk to people about that or how you would instruct someone to tell a story that may be you know painful but they want to tell in a nuanced humorous you know separated way from themselves yeah well i think what i you know all of the stories that um, are in the Bohemian Love Diaries, which is the, the last book that came out, um, I've been performing and making a living on stage telling them as stories um, for about five years previous to that. And I remember when I we took it to the publisher, um, 
in the first draft and he was like well what is this like and i was like oh <laughs> it's like it's exactly a transcript from what i do on stage people laugh at it and they cry and it's like great he's like well this is a book and you just can't transcribe like what you're doing on stage into book form and you have to go and be a writer and do that and so i had to go back in and and doing that it really changed it because i think what i needed for those first five years before the story became a book was i really needed to like hear laughter and be healed by that laughter mm -hmm and it helped people tell me their stories in a very an easier way it wasn't like this like raw dark stuff right. but I, it wasn't until like i read the glass castle by jeanette walls Wa jeanette walls mm -hmm. you know, which is a, it's out as a movie mm -hmm. this this month um i didn't understand how i could be raised by um two educated parents a father with a master's in art but yet he he suffered so much and he how can you be educated and be a racist how can you like be so loving but like you become this like demon when you drink um and it was the first glimpse i saw like where you know she had a, a two parent or at least her dad had a master's degree but they lived in a car like right. homeless and so mm -hmm. it began to help me shape that things weren't really black and white but in that bohemian love diaries things needed to be black and white for me and i remember in that first draft when my agent looked at it and then she sent it back she goes I got something to tell you. And we were about to send it to the publisher. We had all, already signed the deal at that point. She goes, there's no emotion in your book. And I remember just being like crushed. I was just like, listen, um, the first draft before I got it to you it took me, you know, two years to get it to you. We've been working on it for another two years. Um, if there's no emotion after four years, like I don't think like another eight years of therapy are going to help me get emotion in these stories. And I, and I did uh, talk to someone who had interviewed um uh, Jeanette about her book and she said oftentimes the first draft it's hard enough to like just get the story out right. and you know putting the emotion is something I think she said comes last and so what I did is I went back in and did it in a very rote way like every third sentence I made sure there was an emotion word in there and eventually on this wow. draft after that and, and it, it totally changed the book mm -hmm. um, at, at the draft after that then I was like okay, it sounds really rote because every third sentence has an emotion word in it. I feel this, I'm feeling this, like I'm happy now. Um, uh, it, I began to like shade it into the sentence a little bit. So you couldn't really, you really couldn't recognize as a mathematical formula, but it was, the motion, it was all mathematical for me. So, I mean, was this a healing process? Was this, did this help you understand your family better? Did this, you know, I mean, that is, that is a fascinating bit of information. I, I think it healed my family in some way. I think like it, I, whenever I come across something, I think I've got the answer. If everyone could do this, like, the, like when my friend died, I was like, for the, the eight years I performed the show, I was like, my friend, I felt like my friend was alive on stage with me mm -hmm. and like his family said the same thing. And, um, you know, the first like two years I performed it, I was still like uh, trying to not uh, perform it as if I had memorized it. Then the second two years, it's like um, it became a little like, how do I add excitement to this? But then after that, it was like I, I was like reliving stuff on stage right. in the moment as it, if it had happened. And so um, that whole idea. Um, and what's your question again? <laughs> what was the question? Did you again? heal? Oh, Did it help oh, you heal? So, so the yeah. And so that whole idea of it transforming me and transforming my relationships, it helped me have conversations with my family that I would have never had before. And because I wasn't angry and it wasn't raw and it was like, screw you guys, you did all this stuff to me. Um, because they could laugh about it, it, it softened it. So we could talk about things in a way that we were never able to talk about before. But back to that idea of like, wow, I've created this like, way to like you write a story about someone who died and then they're alive and you keep their memory alive and like it's almost like if you write like this memoir in a way that's like where you let go of the anger and it's a little it's really humorous then like you're able to heal something in the family that's the secret but you know there's all kinds of secrets on how to deal do it and deal with it um it didn't open up any family member that was closed before about the holocaust experiences but um it really? did about yeah. the alcoholism and stuff like that so, but how, I mean, because I know that you said, you've said that your mom still doesn't talk about it and it's still, yeah. you know, but how did she feel about you talking about it? Well, you know, like I, I ended up performing um, parts of the story at the, the um, National Holocaust Museum and I remember she came to it, you know, I'm performing there like surrounded by 
all these things, you know, all these like horrific memorabilia, the Nazi flag and things like that. And I remember after the performance, like she just ran out and went home and didn't talk to me. Um, and as like, as I came out of the Jewish closet before the book came out and began to perform more work with Jewish content, she was really scared. I remember I got a review for one of my shows in the Washington Post and, um, you know, she had spent her whole life hiding this. And um, here I was like exposing her. Right. I felt think she felt really vulnerable, which is kind of goes par for the course with the first generation of Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. The second generation, not so much, and definitely the third generation, they let go over a little bit more. Right. So what about your dad? And, you know, it seems like he's not as guarded. And I mean, you talk about addiction and you talk about, you know, the struggles that he's had and his family struggles. How, how did he react to you coming out of the closet with that as well? I mean, so much, as you said, so much of what we deal with, with, you know, within our families, especially families that struggle with trauma or mental illness or, you know, um, secrets is, is shame, you know, that, that, you know, you have to keep everything about what we are a secret. And so we live with a lot of shame. Um, so, I mean, your dad, how did he react to this? Well, you know, in the, the book, he's like the hero of the story, but um, I think people that know, um, that look at things in a deeper, more profound way, they know there's a story of an addiction and, and drinking in there, but it's really kind of like drinking light in there. There's not like a lot of drinking. There's not like a lot of my response to his drinking. And so it's kind of absent from the book. And so the real book is like what's under that. I think if like I wrote it now after writing that version, it would be a lot more raw and a lot more true. And um true to life but like uh, I don't know what uh, his reaction is really because I haven't exposed like his alcoholism in the same way that I've exposed like my mom's hiding from the Holocaust and like mm -hmm. the struggles we've had had with that um, I finally um, found the 12 step rooms in a in family support groups um, about a, a couple years ago when I when I hit my rock bottom um, and, you know, a, so much of that, um, those rooms and uh, to just to tell you how, how deeply I hit rock bottom, like I, for almost a year and a half, I, I, um, went to meetings three times a day. It was like what was saving my life. Like wow. I didn't want to live anymore. Um, and it wasn't so much that I wanted to die, but it was, um, I didn't, I didn't know how to change my life. So I didn't keep making the same mistakes. I didn't see my relationship changing with my family, which was really hard. And I didn't see, I just kept getting the, the same relationship over and over again, which was like, um, you know, another narcissistic abusive relationship. And I didn't know how to change any of that. And so a lot of, uh, I'd say like 90, I'd say, well, I'd say 50% of what hap goes on in the, in the 12 step rooms is like healing through storytelling. Right. And the more stories I heard of my story, it was like, the more I healed, and then fifty percent is this like some our connection to to um, something that's greater than us. I call God, right. um, and so all my stories about um, uh, the alcoholism and the addiction that affected our family, it didn't go into a book. It went into those rooms three times a day, three hours a day for a year and a half, and it kind of dissipated and, and left me. I, I didn't feel like I had a need to like write about it after that I think if I wouldn't have found the rooms I would either kill myself or um, I would have written about it and right. then it still would have haunted me my, most of my life so wow. you know I, I when you're talking I'm thinking about how you know how we make peace with where we come from and where where we're headed and the things that we um, that we find in the world to um, to help us along the path. And uh, so many of us who, you know, face these challenges, which is basically everyone on earth, um, find ourselves in some, to some degree in that place where you were, where you said, I don't want to keep making the same mistakes. I want to be able to trust that I can move forward from this place and, you know, heal my relationships and heal my relationship with myself and understand. Um, so, I, you talk a lot about your higher power and your um, and you know you and I are friends, so we ta we have talked about your you know twelve step experience and the other things that you you know you use. And so part of this whole process here, the reason we're here is really to 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 bring everything out into the light, but also to talk about ways in which we 
work toward recovery and we work toward healing ourselves and our lives. And so I'd love to hear more. I know that the 12 step program is, has been huge in your life, but you know, where does God play a part in this and where does spirituality play a part in all of your healing? And, and, you know, I know that you were really involved in yoga and, you know, I mean, talk about how all of those things have sort of helped you to put yourself back together. Hmm. Well, I mean, coming from a family that suffers from addiction, I think, I don't think I know, like I have approached nearly everything in my life as an addict would. And so I remember early on, in the 12 step recovery when I was trying to, to, to stay alive, you know, I decided to do 90 yoga classes in 90 days. And so, um, it was a disaster. I made it to day 80 and like blew out my shoulder. And then I was in physical therapy for the next four months and I couldn't do yoga at all. That's what an addict does. It's like if one lollipop tastes good then like, let's eat the whole box now. Right. Um, and traditionally I've done things. Um, I was never into drinking myself or like alcohol. Um, but I've done things that are, uh, from, all respects from the outside will look healthy and so what i got addicted to exercise really early on because like people like yeah so great he's like staying in shape and like i you know i went from uh you know like working out and exercise in a way addict might to like um becoming obsessed with like the way my body looked and like uh like totally masking like self-esteem issues and uh, and um body issues and then you know to running marathons in the same way and like in, in a sense you could look at that as a metaphor of like wow what are you really running from you're spending all that time away from people just like training for this like um thing that ha- that you've given meaning to um also at, so after like i blew up my shoulder and couldn't do yoga at all i decided that um the Muslims really had it going on with praying five times a day. And so I decided like I would pray five times a day for 30 days because a friend of mine said, um, you should just try it for a week. Try, try praying five times a day. And so, so I, in my mind as an addictive mind, I was like, well, if five times a day for a week, he said, makes you feel good. Well, I'm going to do it for a month. And again, like I go, what I noticed in my, my addictive personality is, you know, towards the end of whatever goal I have, I, it's, I start to crash and burn. And so at day 25, like with the yoga, I didn't make 90 days. I made it to like 83 days. And with the, the praying for 30 days straight, five times a day, I didn't make it 30 days. I made it maybe like 27 days. But what happens towards the end is like, I, it feels like I can't keep up. It's like, oh, I've got to go to yoga again, I'm, but I'm tired. I don't want to go. I got to pray again, like, but I don't want to. And then I become resentful, but like, I can do it. I can struggle through this. And then I just throw it away. I'm like, screw this. I, I can't right. do this. Um, but I remember at day 27, like, and I've always, um, always, people think it's strange, but um, like heard God's voice when I pray. Um, and a big part of the 12 step recovery is the prayer meditation. Um, and I heard the voice really clearly on day 27. It's like, wow, you've been like talking incessantly at me for like 27 days, for five <laughs> times a day. How could you even know, hear me talking? You need to just shut up for a while. And at that point, um, I oh had gosh. tried to meditate for years. Right. Um, and I told people I meditated, but really what I would do, I would sit down in the morning and I would I would pray for maybe like 10 or 15 minutes and I'd meditate for one or two minutes. And I got this app called the Insight Timer and I, I c- couldn't go for more than like maybe two or three minutes. And I'd get to antsy and forget about it. Um, but after that moment, when I heard that voice really clearly saying, quit talking and you're actually going to hear something, I, for the first time, like the very next day after that, when I quit praying, I sat for 90 minutes. And after that, I, I can sit for long periods of time now with no problem. But um, it was about what I learned about the difference between listening and hearing um, and the idea that, man, I could be missing some important information just by, by not being quiet enough to hear it. How did things change for you in the rest of your life? after that i mean i i i you know over the last couple of years i've started meditating actively Mm -hmm. um and if there are you know we if if i miss it for a week if i miss it for a day it's a day but if i if i miss my meditation practice for a week I notice that pretty much everything in my life that requires me to be able to think and organize and, you know, plan and I can't do any of those things. Mm -hmm. I don't. So, I mean, I need to do it in order to be able to function at the level that I want to function at. Yeah. Um, So I'm just curious, you know, when you when you shut up and you started listening, how did it change other aspects of your life? 
Well, I the the piece that I didn't put in there was that um, I, during that time to get my life straight, I I wasn't working for a year and a half. Um, I had some savings set aside, and like I decided not to date for a year and a half. I decided to like, and I I did what in the program is known as detachment with love, and so I had didn't even talk to my family for a year and a half. And wow. I spent for the first time in my life, I spent Christmas, my birthday, and Thanksgiving completely alone. And I wanted to, and I remember driving around looking for some place to eat on Thanksgiving and nothing in Richmond was open. And I was just like, I need to remember this because like my decisions got me here. It wasn't like life happening to me. I, I, I had like screwed up in a major way to like have my life happen this way. Um, and so I forgot your question again. How did the rest of your life change when you started listening instead of oh. talking? So anyway, um, the message that I heard when God said, um, you know, shut up and quit talking at me all the time, five times a day. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. He was, he said to me, you can start dating now. And I was like blown away. And so I was like, and that's like a typical guy. Like, I think right. maybe not a guy thing, but like anyone that's lonely is like, yeah. wow, that's like huge information. I wouldn't start dating for a few months after that. But, um, I never heard anything after that. I was like, I got it. That's an important, that's really important <laughs> to hear that. I'm probably going to hear something even more important. And since then it's been two years. Like, Nothing. I haven't heard nothing, nothing. Like, but I get quiet because I, I I don't want to miss that right. whatever message it is. That's amazing. So that is so incredible. Um, yeah. I let me make sure. Let's look at the time. Oh yeah, we're we're, we're over good. time. Okay. Um, you're amaze balls, and I just mm. really appreciate you being here and being a guinea pig in episode number two. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much. Oh yeah, I wish you all the luck. I, this 